There are hundreds of videos that haven't been launched on YouTube on Patreon. Make sure you guys join the Patreon to help us grow. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Your host, Derek Lambert. And we have Bryce Blankenagel, host of the Naked Mormonism Podcast. Guys, exhaustive history on these details when it comes to this story, as you can see. And he's he's like forcing himself to move on. Like, I got to keep going. We're never going to get to the end. And I already know you want to check out his podcast. Go to his Patreon. You guys can join, listen to all his previous episodes. And then it's like a cup of coffee a dollar for an episode and they're hours long you can get access all the stuff that he has on there you might as well go do it now and also we have the author david fitzgerald the complete heretics guide to western religion and the mormons his book there it is right there and you got to get this book guys i'm telling you david just started a patreon as well he's trying to take off so you guys can be part of that uh, process and he will always remember you, if you will. Your name will be in the Lamb's Book of Life as well. I forgot to mention that. So you'll enter into the new Jerusalem uh, with no issues. Peter will see it VIP right in. And uh, we're going to be talking about early Mormonism, guys. I mean, this guy, the more that I'm learning about Joseph Smith, I hate to say this. It's like when I watched, <laughs> you already know where I'm going. Like when I watched The Sopranos, for example, like I'm like, this guy's a bad guy. Okay. This guy's like, but he loves his family. Like he really loves what he does in life. And he's a, he does love family. He has family tendencies. He has things that I personally, you know, can relate to at the same time. He's a bad guy. And Joseph Smith's a bad guy, but like when he gets captured, I'm like, is he going to escape? He better make it. You know, I don't know why I want the bad guy to win. It's like, there's something wrong with me. So <laughs> Bryce, will you, will you help us out, man? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so okay uh this has been uh you know a crusade that i've sounded off about on this series before but like this is the side of joseph smith that no mormons learn and it's so damn interesting uh, if, if they were to teach this stuff in church i'd like to think that the the church would be a lot more mature that the members themselves would be a lot more mature because you, you you when you examine the life of this guy and and just the the story arc that he left in, in his legacy you see so many things about the human condition that are uh, that are not curable, that, that are things that we all deal with to some extent. And I, I love exploring this world of Joseph Smith. And there's a, a whole community of people similarly minded who explore this person and explore this history because there's just so many fascinating stories within it. And it does cause you, like you said, Derek, where you're like, why am I rooting for the bad guy? What the hell's going on here? It feels weird. But still at the same time, for some reason, we like an unlikable hero. It's it's weird well, or, or uh, actually, yeah. He's a very likable hero. He's a pure villain, straight up villain. But yeah. I mean, the guy is charming. Yeah, and charming. And that's it. There's the, he. He's one of those people that has that X factor, that has yeah. that intangible human element that we don't know why, but we gravitate towards those individuals. And I don't think that anybody living as a contemporary of him could answer that question more than we can today. Of what is so appealing about this character? What's so fascinating? Why does he capture and cultivate our our minds and our imaginations so much? Uh, and there's there's just there's more there to the story than the story itself will tell us and I, for that reason alone i just i i revel in this history i love it i i just can't get enough of this stuff me too you left off with porter rockwell <clears throat> looking like john the baptist down in a bar and he beats the <laughs> crap out of some guys and he's looking at joseph smith like yeah, we're about to throw down, buddy. Like nine months of no shaving, probably eating honey and locusts. You know what I mean? There's no telling what this guy was yeah. doing. Well, it's and it's worse than that because they they say, Joe, come down quick. There's some crazy Sasquatch man down here. And so they come in. They don't know who it is. They all of a sudden, you know, and then Joe sees eyes and sees who it is. And it's just this magical reunion, you know. Well, and to be clear, like, yeah, the dude hadn't shaved, but he also hadn't bathed. He had been living in dungeons for nine months. Like he 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 was he was not recognizable until you saw his eyes. And it's yeah. like these these guys have, you know, Porter Rockwell and Joseph Smith have been friends since they were like five years old. 
You know, you know those the, those eyes, regardless of how much grime is covering them. Exactly. And so let's talk about Porter Rockwell, right? So this guy, you know, he had been friends with Joseph Smith long before the church was ever conceived, long before the gold plates, long before any of this. The, the Rockwells and the Smiths were good friends uh, in Palmyra and Manchester area. Um, so they, they become good friends and uh, throughout the entire history of the church, you know, Porter Rockwell is the youngest person baptized into the church on its first day, April 6, 1830, uh, in, in New York, he was, you know, close to confidant of Joseph Smith in Kirtland and Missouri, Porter Rockwell made himself more and more useful to the prophet in whatever way he possibly could. Um, and then finally in Nauvoo, now when the church is at its, you know, at its critical mass and it is requiring underground assassin squads uh, in order to survive. This guy is placed at the head of one of the companies of this assassin squad that's known as the Destroying Angel Company. And that becomes a euphemism as a warning for, from the prophet or from anybody who is you know, in the community. You know that if you speak out about the church, then you're going to get a visit from the Destroying Angel, which became synonymous with Porter Rockwell himself. Um, so he is, you know, for, for all of these same reasons that were like, Joseph Smith is a likable villain. Porter Rockwell is as much in the, the culture of the church today as he was back then. He is mythologized as a, you know, a wild west badass that Mormons love today, even though he was a total monster. He was a murderer. Yeah. He was suddenly definitely wanted on your side because he would come through to you he would get you over that mountain. He would get through whatever it took. Porter was your guy. Yes, absolutely. Uh, he also was a notorious screw up. Uh, so there, uh, this is more so the case in the Utah era, but he was also not, let's just say he had some street smarts, but he wasn't always the smartest when it came to logistics. And there were a few assassinations that he botched that uh, Bill Hickman had to come in and clean up. And there, there were a few times where Porter Rockwell screwed up. Um, but under Joseph Smith's command, uh, him and Joseph were such close friends. It didn't matter if Porter Rockwell screwed up. They were going to be friends no matter what. Uh, and it was this symbiotic relationship between these two men. Uh, but Porter Rockwell... I was going to say, I think it's interesting that Wyatt Earp uh, and Parrot Gat, I think it is. What's it say? It says uh, Wyatt Earp and I'm looking at Wikipedia real quick and Pat Garrett. So like while he was uh, he was fam he was famous and controversial, controversial during his lifetime as Wyatt Earp and Pat Garrett. So lots of people know like Tombstone, you know, the show, the movie Tombstone with Wyatt Earp. Like this guy's like that, you know, he's, yeah. he's that kind of figure. Well, he, he, was, he had a reputation as a gunslinger because he had killed, mm -hmm. I want to say 43 men that they knew about in open, just an open, you know, draw and boom, you know, uh, yeah. not counting all the people he'd been assigned to kill secretly on the down low. Yeah, yeah. Well, and his career of, of uh, murdering obviously expands greatly in Utah because uh, there are no he is he is the law. Right. Um, and it's him. It's Bill Hickman. It's Jedediah Grant, who was Brigham's sledgehammer. Uh, it's Hosea Stout. There, there's a whole litany of these these uh, of these dark and seedy figures. And, you know, Samson Avard was that in Missouri. And, you know, Joe always had a cabal of these darker figures around him. Uh, at any given time, because those people are super useful when you're trying to build an empire, right? Uh, and that's what Joseph Smith, at the end of the day, that's what he was always aspiring to was building an empire. Uh, but, you know, Porter Rockwell had been imprisoned and Joe had sent that guy Jackson to go down and finish off Boggs and to break Porter Rockwell out of prison. And Jackson wasn't successful. Um, but also like Jackson was getting more and more ingratiated in the, the leadership of the church. Um, and Porter Rockwell didn't like Joseph Jackson, um, thought that he was an enemy or another Bennett type figure who was just there as an opportunist looking for aggrandizement. Um, so Porter Rockwell was Joseph Smith's bodyguard in all of this. Was it say that again? Yeah. And he might, and might well have been that exactly that an opportunist who was just in there as a, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so it is notable, right? Like uh, Porter Rockwell gets arrested by these bounty hunters uh, and taken to Missouri. And he's, con you know, conveyed around all sorts of, of different prisons and stuff like that. Um, so what the state had on evidence to try and convict Porter Rockwell was the affidavit of the guy that he shot claiming that it was Porter Rockwell who pulled the trigger. 
Mm. That's all the evidence that they truly had to try and convict Porter Rockwell, which the state knew that they couldn't, that that, that, that was the evidence was too flimsy to carry out the conviction. Right. Huh. Not to say that we don't have good evidence ourselves now looking at 2020 hindsight to say, oh, here's the gun that did it. Here's his connection to it. Blah, blah, blah. So in in hindsight, we have good reason to think that, yes, he was the one. He was the shooter. Um, but. Anyway, as you said, but but at the time, right? It's always cloudy when the events are contemporary, right? Um, so so the the state is moving him around different jails, trying to get different convictions, uh, trying to you know hold him for for different uh, charges and stuff like that. Um, and he attempts his first prison break, and this first prison break, he basically works with somebody else who had recently been convicted. Uh, allow you know gets him to use some of the tools and a, a pouch of uh, buck shot that he uh, tried to use as a blunt weapon um and this is the escape attempt mm -hmm. where like he wrestles with the the woman jailer and like tumbles over her as they fall down the stairs and he runs out into the courtyard and vaults the fence and the guy who he like worked with to escape couldn't vault the fence because he was too uh -oh. fat and he had eaten too much uh, so Porter Rockwell goes back and tries to rescue him. But by the time Porter Rockwell gets him, that guy over the fence, the whole town is out. It's late at night. Everybody is out there surrounding him and they try and lynch him on the spot right there for trying to escape from prison. Uh, wow. But the jailer was able to successfully get the jail cell closed and get the people out and keep Porter Rockwell in. Um, so that first uh, escape attempt did not work out for him. Um, so they tried to convict him for escaping, uh, attempting to escape prison, uh, but so through some technicalities, the charge didn't actually stick. So they were just like, all right, so we're going to hold you over to court uh, until like the, the autumn the autumn session of court. So you have to stay in jail. Um, and he tries to escape again. And this second escape attempt involves him uh, while he is uh, chained and not hobbled, but while he is chained, he rips the stovepipe out of the ceiling of the dungeon and he takes off his clothes and lines the hole because it's, you know, it's a hole cut in a wooden floor. He lines the hole with his clothes and tries to and climbs through the stovepipe hole, which is, you know, it's 14 inches across. Like, and he's a, he's a stout guy. <laughs> Uh, but because he was being mistreated, he was also very underfed in all of this. So he had lost a ton of weight. He was gaunt. He was had low energy. Um, so he had lost a lot of weight and he was able to slink up through that stovepipe hole. Um, and he was also able to, to rig um, some tools up and he was able to get through the first door. But jail cells, uh, jails in that time had two sets of doors. They had the inner door that had a locking mechanism on the inside and then they had the outer door with a locking mechanism on the outside. Um, second door and then he resigned himself to his fate and was too tired to even crawl back through the hole so he just laid there on the floor and passed yep. out and they the jailer found him the next morning on the upper floor out of the dungeon having escaped but unable to get through the door and eventually that was one of the charges another attempt to escape prison that was finally the charge that stuck so uh he ends up uh getting um if we remember back to the missouri mormon war there <clears throat> if we remember back so, to the yeah <clears throat> if we if we remember back to the missouri mormon Russia, nope all right one more again. time yeah i did it again yeah. sorry okay um if we remember back to the 1838 war in missouri there was a general in the missouri militia uh, who was a friend of the Mormons, but wasn't a Mormon. Uh, he was known as a Jack Mormon. And this is the guy that one of the generals commanded to execute Joseph Smith in the town square of far West the next morning. And this guy refused that order. He refused to carry out an order from his superior officer. This guy is named General Alexander Donovan. Well, this guy, Alexander Donovan, was legal counsel for the Mormons uh, during the, the Court of Inquiry after the, the 1838 Mormon War and the two Mormon cities surrendered and were sacked uh, and the Mormons were forced out. Um, well, Porter Rockwell wanted Alexander Donovan to guard him or to uh, serve as his legal counsel. 
Uh, and Donovan said, well, I have too much of a caseload. I can't do this. And the judge there was like, it doesn't matter. You're his legal counsel now. So Donovan was like, I'm not sure what to do with this Porter Rockwell guy. Um, I'm going to try and get him transferred out because all of the judges were the same judges that were, you know, the people that were intimidated when their houses were surrounded by the Mormons. They were the same, all the same people that were involved in the Missouri Mormon war just five years prior. So Donovan tries to get Porter Rockwell a, a transfer and he ends up getting a transfer successfully pulled through. Um, and when the transfer happens, these two constables are responsible for conveying Porter Rockwell three days on horseback to the, the location transfer. Um, and they do this knowing that the Missouri citizens view Porter Rockwell as public enemy number one. Uh, he will be assassinated if these constables aren't careful transferring him from one jail to the other. Um, so to prevent him from escaping, they tie his legs underneath the horse and then tie his hands behind his back and they carry him on horseback three days on back roads to keep away from any possible assassins who were trying to kill him. Uh, and that's a weekend fun trip that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, lots of fun. Lots of fun. Yeah. And Rockwell even said that it was a hard riding horse and he doesn't even have like his leg strength in, in, you know, holsters or anything. He's just bouncing along for miles and miles and miles. <laughs> so you got to feel bad for him too. And he's also underfed. Uh, he's probably, uh, you know, struck with dysentery and, and diseases. Um, he's, he's in a bad way. Dude is suffering a lot. And like, this is, uh, I don't care who you are. Like prisoners don't deserve this treatment. I don't care what you've done. Like you don't deserve this. People don't deserve treatment like this, but he got it. Uh, and he was public enemy number one. Um, so he gets transferred to that jail and uh, there's another hearing that's scheduled in front of a different judge who was uh, more impartial to what happened. Uh, and the judge said, Hey, there's a problem with the paperwork. Sorry. Take him back. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> and the constables have to carry him back on another three day horse ride tied and hobbled to the horse uh bouncing and evading assassination attempts of which there were uh there was a, they had tried to assassinate him both on the journey out there and on the journey back without success <clears throat> so once again he's hobbled he's he's restrained he can't do anything uh he's thrown in a dungeon and he just has to wait it out and finally General Donovan was able to get him a hearing in front of Justin, uh, Justice Austin King. And Justice King is the very judge who ha chaired the November Court of Inquiry with the Mormons back in 1838. Um, and he's they went forward with enough uh, evidence that the charge for him, they didn't have enough evidence to charge him for murder uh, or attempted murder. The charge ended up being attempting to escape prison. How ironic is that? It's like the Al Capone. It's like, oh yeah, all these you know machine gunnings. We can't get you on, but but tax evasion, tax yes, evasion. We'll yes, exactly. Yep, yep. <laughs> they they always get you on something like that, right? Uh, so they uh, they have a full hearing. He pleads not guilty to trying to escape, escape prison, which he did. General Donovan <laughs> tries to argue a technicality that breaking out of prison involves breaking a lock or something to that effect, and which Porter Rockwell didn't break any locks. He didn't break any I doors. Just his chimney. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so the the justice determined. Uh, so Justice King determined that attempting to walk through a door to escape prison is also incorporated in the Missouri law. Uh, you don't just have to break a, a locking mechanism. Uh, so the jury comes down with a guilty verdict and he is sentenced to five minutes in jail. No. <laughs> they should have got him for trespassing. No. Oh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so five minutes in jail and ends up turning into five hours in jail. Porter Rockwell knows that if he's caught or if he's seen on the roads, once he's released that it doesn't matter what the state says. Yeah. Everybody in that state knows that he is guilty and that he was part of the Mormon assassin squad and that, you know, Lilburn Boggs was shot by this guy. Everybody knows who Porter Rockwell is. Um, so he's going to be assassinated. Hold on, hold uh, on, hold on. This is important. Okay. This, why do I feel like I don't want this guy to get killed and I want him to survive? <laughs> you're painting this is so good dude yeah. do a yeah. show on this like seriously <laughs> hbo and uh, netflix right? i'm not uh, even kidding you like i can yeah. see this and he's about to escape and there's people who are like yeah 
oh, he's leaving the jail in a few minutes. All right. It's like, but I don't want, yeah. I want him to hide in the woods and like find <laughs> his way through the swamps and like now. Okay. Well, right, let's, sorry. let's, let's, uh, let's add some more details to this, right? Because the whole time that Rockwell is in prison in Missouri, he's also hearing, you know, like he's in jail where uh, Sheriff Reynolds is the warden. Now, Sheriff Reynolds was one of the two sheriffs who arrested Joseph Smith in Dixon, Illinois. He was one of the sheriffs who worked with the special orders from the governors of Missouri and Illinois to arrest and extradite Joseph Smith to Missouri. Right. Rockwell heard while he was in the prison, Sheriff Reynolds talking about this attempted arrest, like he, they, they were about to leave to go arrest him, uh, to arrest Joseph Smith. Um, so when that happens, Reynolds leaves. He, you know, Rockwell hears all of this. Uh, and this is what Rockwell said after he escaped. He said, quote, Knowing that they were after Joseph and no means under heaven of giving him any information, my anxiety became so intense knowing their determination to kill him that my flesh twitched upon my bones. I could not help it twitch. It would. While undergoing this sensation, I heard a dove alight on the window in the upper room of the jail and commenced cooing and then went off. In a short time, he came back to the window where a pane was broken. He crept between the bars of iron, which were about two and a half inches apart. I saw the dove fly around the trap door several times. It did not alight, but continued cooing until it crept through the bars again and flew out through the broken window. I relate this as it was the only occurrence of the kind that happened during my long and weary imprisonment, but it proved a comfort to me. The twitching of my flesh ceased, and I was fully satisfied from that moment that they would not get Joseph into Missouri and that I should regain my freedom. And that does name the Holy Spirit. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So not only does Joe not know what's going on with Rockwell in Missouri prisons, Porter Rockwell doesn't know what's going on in, in Nauvoo and in Illinois. He doesn't have any idea what's going on. And all he knows is that Sheriff Reynolds, his warden, is heading off to Illinois to go arrest Joseph Smith. And these guys are trying to kill Joe, right? This is his childhood friend. This is a person who he has taken a vow, a decree, a covenant with God to, to protect him with his own life. And all he can do is sit there hobbled in his chains and, you know, underfed, under-resourced and just dark and cold in these prisons. There's nothing he can do but just sit there and deal with it. Right. So, like, there's yeah. there's the, you got to also feel sorry for for both Porter Rockwell and Joseph Smith, because these are these are childhood friends torn apart by the system of laws that they have been flaunting for years. And neither of them knows the whereabouts or the safety of the other. They don't know what is going on with each other. The main so thing be, when you look at Mormon history, how there's two sides, there's the, the official side where it's only tells the good side about how amazing these people were. And then there's the shadow side where you see uh, what they did and who they murdered and whose lives they ruined. But it's, it's fascinating to be able to see both of that and still root for these guys, it, you know, in <laughs> your way. It's very Game of Thrones that way. Very it Game is. of Thrones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's one thing that you realize when you're studying uh, basically any history is that there really are no heroes. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You have heroes, you know, you better be prepared to have those heroes tarnished, <clears throat> have them degraded because the heroes yeah. aren't real. People are real. Um, I think that's so, also what makes yeah. the the epics a lot of times like the Greek epics more suspenseful and more I think relatable than like the gospel epics of Jesus, if you will. Like mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you know, Jesus is almost too perfect. It's like, eh, it's hard to. It's, it, there's good examples there, right? There's some good examples, but like you know, uh, some of the stories are more human in the Greek epics, which makes it interesting. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, I think that. Uh, I, I, I like that about the Greek epics more, you know, there's, there's more real, I think there's more reality in those, uh, you know, than just, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, what's interesting about that is just to go down a very small rabbit hole is when we start with our oldest and original gospel, Mark's gospel, he's the most fallible human Jesus. And it's like, you know, that they, they Mark sets him up as a human guy 
who's born human, just like us, and who gets adopted by God at his baptism. And he goes into the garden and gets somebody. He doesn't know everything's going to be hunky-dory. He just knows this. Okay, God <laughs> is telling him, now you have to die for a sin for Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you read the Garden of Gethsemane story like that, it gives you chills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Three he's Gospels later, by the time John goes around and he's like, oh, no, he's super God. He might as well have I am God written on his T-shirt. It, it, he's just slumming. There's just no pathos, no drama at all. Um, you, you broke out for a second. And, yeah. It, and as you say, it's because he's more human. Oh, uh, where did you lose me? Uh, where do we, we lose him? With the Gospel the of John. Yeah. yeah. There's no pathos. There's no drama. There's no human connection to him at all. The mm -hmm. way there is in the earliest gospel. And they, he just gets better and more Superman like with each successive gospel. Mm, uh, so true, David. Uh, Bryce, I have to ask you this to keep us on track. What the heck happens? Okay. He hears that his friend's going to get killed. He's got a few hours till he's about to be released. How does he make it there? Like what the heck happens? So, in all of this, um, Porter Rockwell's mom actually is one of the people who's trying to coordinate his legal counsel and his escape and everything. She ends up meeting with her son in the prison in Missouri, and then she travels up to Nauvoo to collect uh, money from Joseph Smith to pay for jo or to pay for Porter Rockwell's uh, uh, legal counsel to pay for General Donovan as his counselor. Um, so she is there on the night that he is released. And she basically tells him, Hey, we have a couple of friends um, go, go to these places. Uh, you can borrow some money from this person and they part ways, you know, mother and son part ways and say, I'll meet you back in Nauvoo. Um, Porter Rockwell determines that there are two ways of going home that uh, are going to be most expected. And he sends her on one of the paths. He takes the other path in hopes of maybe diverting or, you know, a, you know, a little subterfuge to try and keep the assassins off his trail. Uh, the vigilantes, I should say. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, really, it's a, it's a matter of perspective, I guess. Um, so he ends up, uh, he doesn't have any shoes at this point. Um, he hasn't changed clothes in five months. Uh, he hasn't bathed in nine months. He hasn't shaved. He is, he is unrecognizable. Anybody who might know what Porter Rockwell looks like back in 1838, this Porter Rockwell looks nothing like it which aided in him traveling across the state of Missouri, which is probably for the best. Uh, General Donovan even warned him, uh, keep on guard, do not travel during the day, take only back roads, and keep on watch when you're traveling during the night. So that's what Porter Rockwell does. He finds uh, barns and stuff to sleep in during the day, and he travels during the night. He's walking 20 to 30 miles every night um, without shoes. His feet are shredded to nothing, um, he borrows $4 from a friend of the Mormons that was still remained in Missouri. And he uses that to pay for lodging and for, for meals. He even rents horses a couple of times to take him on short stints of the journey. Um, but he takes, he takes a number of weeks to get back to Nauvoo. He's released December 13th. He arrives in Nauvoo on Christmas day. Um, and he what? uses the last 50 cents of that $4 to take the ferry from Montrose, Iowa, across the Mississippi into Nauvoo. He had to um, be freezing. <laughs> yes, freezing. And, and he's walking over frozen ground without shoes as well. So his feet are just cut up. At one point, he stops for three days to try and, quote unquote, recruit his feet. Um <laughs> Because he was, they were just so, just so torn up. He couldn't walk anymore. Right. Um, <laughs> he's, it just, he's in a real, he was in really bad shape. And of course he's for nine months, he's been underfed as well. I mean, fed Holocaust rations basically. Yeah. Um, so he's lost a ton of weight. He looks gaunt and sunken in cheekbones. Um, and he, Porter Rockwell is a portly guy. He's a big guy. And for him to be in this state, he doesn't, he's not recognizable. Um, so in this state is when he interrupts the Christmas party at the Nauvoo mansion late at night. Uh, there's a brawl that, and, and there's this Missourian throwing punches at the patrons and Joseph Smith hears what's going on and says, throw the Missourian out. And he comes down and pushes in front of the crowd and sees it's his old friend, Porter Rockwell throws a big hug around him and they drink and they are merry. 
<laughs> yeah. What? And, and two minutes before this, they all had their Bowie knives out. They were yeah. going to gut <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yep. Um, and Joseph was in his uh, military regalia for this as well, for this meeting. Wow. Uh, which this, it really provides a, a crazy dichotomy between what the people that are his subjects have suffered, but Joseph Smith had never had to suffer himself. He's in his battle regalia while yeah. Porter Rockwell shows up having been locked in prison for nine months, hobbled, crippled, uh, gaunt and underfed. Um, it really, it, it really exemplifies this dichotomy. Yeah. Wow. And that is a moment too, that Joseph looks at him and says, as long as you are faithful to church, no blade or bullet will ever harm you. You're the new Samson. Let me, yeah, let me find that exact quote was because what happened, right? So once Joe realizes part of Rockwell, he gets him a bunch of food and drinks and, and everybody's happy at the triumphant return of the destroying angel, right? Christmas at Day, this help. time. Uh, yeah. So Porter Rockwell tells Joseph Smith everything that happened. And the next day, what, what's awesome about this is Mormons are incessant record keepers. So the next day, Porter Rockwell goes and files an affidavit to add to the Mormon persecution that happened in Missouri. And Porter Rockwell tells all of this stuff to a person who writes everything down verbatim. Porter Rockwell is illiterate, right? We, we wouldn't have his detailed account of what transpired during his nine months in Missouri, if not for the Mormons being incessant record keepers. But because he was, we have the contemporary source, which is wow. really awesome. Um, so he regales everybody with the story and Joseph Smith sits back silently and sits for several minutes and then, uh, quote, placing his arm around his friend's shoulder announced for all to hear. I prophesy in the name of the Lord that you or Porter Rockwell, so long as ye shall remain loyal and true to thy faith, need fear no enemy. Cut not thy hair and no bullet or blade can harm thee, end quote. And, uh, and he, that's this from uh, Hal Schindler's excellent biography oh, of Porter oh, Rockwell, a uh, man of God, son of, God thunder. son of thunder. Yeah. It's amazing biography. Yeah. Truly incredible. Wow. I have to say just a, a quick plug. I've written a science fiction trilogy. I've told you guys this before. It's a, it's got time travel and Porter Rockwell is one of the characters in book three. Um, I, that's how much I always have liked this magnificent bastard. <laughs> yeah, he truly is. He's, he's just a hell of an awesome figure. He really, really is amazing. Yeah. And Mormon lore of the Utah period is replete with stories about Porter Rockwell. Oh yeah. Um, and and a lot of people, uh, their ancestors have stories about Porter Rockwell. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, one of my mentors uh, shared uh, what happened when his great great grandfather encountered Porter Rockwell on a path through a canyon. Um, and his, you know, this person's great, great grandpa was driving a carriage. Porter Rockwell was just on a horse, uh, and he was driving the carriage. Didn't know what, you know, who this person was just had a hood up over his head, uh, long hair coming out of it. Um, and, and this guy's riding the carriage on the trail. It's not wide enough for them to pass each other. Uh, and Rockwell, just when, you know, they're coming to each other, Rockwell just yells out in this kind of high pitched voice, get out of my way. And the guy knew that's Porter Rockwell. <laughs> get the hell out of his way. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, a lot of people with Mormon ancestry have stories like that. Yeah. I have yeah. another story if we have just a few minutes to tell it. Yeah. Uh, some young punk kid came up and wanted to call him out in the street, you know, gunslinger style. And the porter looked at him and said, I think I know your dad. Go on home, boy. And, and uh, the kid tries to shoot him. He does not blink at all while this guy is shooting at him. And he took, comes out and starts doing the, you know, dance thing where he starts shooting at the guy's feet to make him stop and uh <laughs> apparently he was never phased by being shot at ever no, after he wasn't after he was the mormon samson and uh yeah. apparently except for one incident that happened in utah he was not shot or stabbed his entire life uh in it's one of joe's few prophecies that actually came true <laughs> and i want to say there was one point where he actually did cut his hair to make a wig for somebody, some mother. He so, did for, yeah. for a widow. Actually, he cut yeah. his hair very late in his life in the 1870s. He cut his hair to make a wig for, for an elderly woman. And it's like, oh, wow. yeah, it's yeah. like, Oh, he's a monster assassin killer. He would kill you as soon as look at you. But you know, he does stuff like that. In, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's also a kind and compassionate guy. If you were his friend, you just gotta his be friend. his friend. Somebody you want on your team for sure. 
Yep. Uh, so Porter Rockwell, of course, you know, before he was arrested, before the whole Boggs incident, before he had to flee Nauvoo, before he was arrested by those bounty hunters, he was running the taxi service, right? And he loved his his horses and carriages. He loved his race horses. He was, you know, that was one of his fascinations. It's you know, like people, you know, like guys are gearheads now, right? Like right. like me, right? Uh, he he loved fast horses, uh, and he loved his whiskey. Um, so he, uh, you know, before he was running the taxi service and one thing that's great about a taxi driver, they hear all sorts of conversations, <laughs> right? Well, Porter Rockwell was no longer the taxi, uh, service in Nauvoo. They, somebody else had taken that job. Uh, but instead what Porter Rockwell did was take over as bartender for Joseph Smith's bar. Uh, and if you know anything about taxi drivers and bartenders, they both hear really interesting conversations, uh, so Joseph gets, you know, one of his most trusted acolytes to be the, the, the bartender at the town's biggest bar, which is Joe's own mansion, right? Um, Emma doesn't like this, though. Emma is really, she does not like having a bar in the house. She thinks it brings in the riffraff. Um, and also, <laughs> how does it look that a prophet of God has a bar in his own home? Um, so she convinces Joseph Smith to get rid of the bar. Well, what, so what she they does is say, hey, it's either me and the kids or it's your bar. But one of them is going to go. <laughs> one of them. Yeah, exactly. And Joe's like, oh, well, but I'm keeping it here for Porter because he needs a job. And she was like, I don't care. Just <laughs> get it out of my house. Uh, so what they did instead is they built just like a, a rickshaw kind of crappy, you know, <laughs> bar wooden shack across the street from the Nauvoo mansion and Porter Rockwell was the bartender over there, you know, and then the patrons of the mansion would go across the street and get drunk. And then they'd come back over and stay the night at the mansion. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. And that, that kind of gets us into early 1844 uh, with Porter Rockwell, <laughs> Joseph Smith, the mansion and everything. Um, uh, but there are a couple of incidences that uh, incidents that occur in 1842 and three, uh, that we we didn't really hit on, but they're just really fun stories in Mormon history, uh, and I think I, I think we should spend some time with those. What do you think, David? We, we got twenty minutes, David. What do you think? Twenty, 20 minutes. minutes. That's enough time because there's like these three little archaeological, uh, what would you call them? Incidents, hoaxes, uh, uh, <laughs> and these um, are supposed to show like his flaws, like right? Oh yeah, aren't they? yeah. It, these are these are one of those stories that it's like it's very clear that Mormonism is pure unflinching bullshit. Exhibit A, this story. Exhibit B, yes. this story. So okay, yes. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we got to start with Book of Abraham, right? And we we barely touched on the Book of Abraham earlier, uh, you know, a few episodes ago. Uh, but it was published in 1842, and what happened is the uh, a guy came in hawking uh, Egyptian artifacts into Kirtland. Okay. Even crazier than that, it was an Irish circus owner. Irish circus owner. I didn't know that detail. Michael Chandler, you're talking, right? Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah, so he comes in and he's hawking uh, mummies and papyri and statues and just uh, Egyptian artifacts. And Joe was like, oh, that's that's the book of Abraham written by Abraham's own hand on papyrus. Uh, <laughs> we'll buy it. And the guy was like, I knew you would say that it's 2,400 bucks. And Joe was like, I got the monies right here. Uh, and that was a ton of money. That was way over market value for some, yeah. some for some dead people and some scraps of papyri. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah. Joe thought Joe was a translator. Right. And he had national renown as a person who could read dead or unknown languages. Uh, <laughs> so this guy, Michael Chandler, you know, he capitalized on that and sold him some some papyrus that were just funerary documents. That's all they were. They were just funerous and funerary documents. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he made a ton yeah. of money and he left. Yeah. You know, with a little heel click laughing as he waltzed out of Kirtland, $2,400 richer. Yeah. And to be fair, these are actual Egyptian artifacts. He wasn't bullshit. Those are. That's true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Actual Egyptian fragments from three different, as it turned out, common funerary manuals from the sixth century BC. 
Um, yeah. So let's mm. let's uh, show a few exhibits here. So if you're looking at the screen now, um, here is uh, if you look Google Book of Abraham, this is what you're going to find. Right. Uh, so there are these papyrus fragments that Joseph Smith pulled apart. Um, and of course, papyrus, this is from it was about from the first, second, maybe third century CE. So, you know, they were 12, 13, 14, 1500 years old when Joseph is playing with them. They kind of fragment and pull apart and, and he kind of destroys them by opening up up the papyri uh, by unrolling them. Um, so what we have here is just, this is the original papyri that Joseph Smith purchased from Michael Chandler here. Um, and you can see the chunks that are missing. Um, it's actually basically glued to this wooden plaque here. Um, and uh, Joseph Smith filled in this little portion, which you can see the chunk that's filled in. Right. This is in the printed version of the book of Abraham. Right. So Joe buys these things in 1835 and he sits on them for seven years, but they're pi finally published in the March 1842 edition of the Times and Seasons. Um, and Joe claims that they are, the, the papyri are the book of Abraham written by Abraham's own hand, which is, if you know Bible timeline, that's crazy stuff. That is crazy, crazy stuff because that would that would predate any text that we have of any Septuagint, uh, you know, but manuscripts we, yeah. by by what twelve hundred years probably. Well, the, oh, oh no, no more than that. It's like mm -hmm. if these are if these are first century, you know, and I've heard uh, that they're like sixth century BC, which is already one thousand five hundred years after the supposed time of Abraham. Who, yeah. fun fact, was also complete bullshit. But yeah. uh, nonetheless, no matter how you slice these, it, yeah, it comes up archaeological fraud uh, for what he's his purposes are. And, um, and, you, and you don't even have to say that Abraham didn't exist, which we already know exactly. did, isn't the case. So exactly. it's like, but like, suppose he does. You, this still doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> not even. Not even. And yeah. Um, <laughs> I totally lost my train of thought where I was going with that. But church authorities, um, they would say, oh, well, you know, um, you know, when, what? here's the fun thing. Once Joseph started making all these claims about, oh, here's an Egyptian artifact. I'm going to translate it for you. One of the beautiful ironies of his life is that he didn't realize that over in France, people are starting to decipher uh, hieroglyphs. The Rosetta Stone has been discovered, and look, look at this. It just opens up the whole language, and now we know what these Egyptian things say. Mm -hmm. And guess what? They're nothing like anything he ever said during his life. Um, and so you guys are, you guys are literally saying pre pretty much like this is obvious evidence yes. of just to show you what he did his whole career and in, in everything that he did. He had a great yeah. imagination. He would create these ideas Absolutely. and and use something that Absolutely. like is falsifiable. It's easily falsifiable, but yes. people just want to believe, yeah. you know. And I will also add for ex Mormons, spot. he could do this on the spot. Yes, exactly. He could do it on the spot. And also, I will say that for ex Mormons, if you take polls for ex Mormons, what led them out of the church? Book of Abraham almost always hits top five. Yeah. It's usually polygamy, Book of Mormon, Book of Abraham, uh, priesthood ban, you know, a litany of other issues. Book of Abraham is usually in the top five it's because huge. it is such a simple open and shut case yeah. that Joseph Smith was a fraud. Yeah. It is so simple. And it's really funny to watch apologists work their way around this thing um, because and what it's devolved into. Story, the changing defenses they use. But go ahead. The go ahead. changing defenses. Exactly. Because the criticism is always the same. The criticism is this isn't the book of Abraham. The book of Abraham isn't a real thing. Joseph made it up. Um, that's the criticism. The criticism stands. Um as more evidence comes out, as more studying is done, they have to change their defenses against that criticism. But the criticism still stands. It doesn't matter how many <laughs> apologetic defenses you come up with. Yeah. If the criticism it, itself is true, no amount of apologetics is going to nullify the criticism. Right. Um, so where the current realm of apologist stands right now is called the catalyst theory, <laughs> where Joseph Smith basically looked at the papyri and then God gave him the vision of what is the book of Abraham. 
right, you right. just don't happen to have any copies of the book of Abraham, but God revealed it to Joseph Smith, but he had to have the physical artifacts of the papyri in order to catalyze the, the revelatory juices. Inspire him. But funny story, <laughs> back in the day when nobody had a copy of the book of Abraham or wondered what had happened to it, they were saying a completely different story. And then one day in the 60s, somebody finds the book of Abraham with Joseph's notes written on it in his own hand and his, uh, and they have the actual thing. And it's like all these stories about, oh, well, you can't, until you see the actual fragment, you really can't judge it's unfair for these so-called experts to criticize it. And boom, lo and behold, we have the exact thing. And yes, it's exactly what Egyptologists have been saying all along. Nope, this is from this book, this book, and this book. We know yep. exactly what they're saying. That's not Pharaoh. That's not even a woman, a man. It's a woman. It's goddess Isis, goddess Maha. Um, and I, and oh careers of Mormon apologists have been forged around this Sorry, for, single thing. For counter apologetics. Yeah, I, and also, like, the, one of the quintessential Mormon apologists, uh, Hugh Nibley, that's, that's a big name in Mormon studies, Hugh Nibley. He learned Egyptian and became BYU's Egyptian professor in order to try and create the apologetics for the Book of Abraham. And he even made his own translation of the actual hypocephalus and, and the, the artifacts that we have when they were discovered in the 1960s. Hugh Nibley himself learned Egyptian and made his own translation of it to try and create the apologetics around it. And what's crazy to me <laughs> is when Hugh Nibley made his own translation of the, the, the papyri, um, he was resurrecting the same arguments that were made in 1856. And that, that argument was somebody who knew Egyptian, who knew Egyptian hieroglyphics, came and visited the Mormons in, uh, in Nauvoo in 1856, I think it was, and looked at the papyri and said, that's not the book of Abraham, that's a funerary text. And even translated some of the words on it from the Egyptian into English. Yeah. And they're the same words that Hugh Nibley translated in the 1960s after they were rediscovered, right? Like it's, in it's 1856, yeah, yeah. the Mormons knew this was a fraud. Yeah. And still in 2020, apologists are their entire careers are centered around this one damn artifact. It's yeah. Mind blowing to me. Wow. Okay. Anyway, so yes, yeah. as a counter apologist myself, this is like the holy grail of of Mormon busting. It's like look yeah. at it, people. You know, <laughs> wow. It's so simple. But what it did do, though, when it's, Joseph published this. It's yeah. the dum 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 of dum 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 dum. <laughs> it is. It is. It's it's dum dum squared. It's it incredible. Dum 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 dum. Um, <laughs> but. When Joe had this all published in 1842, this caught a lot of people's attention. And uh, uh, two of these people are named uh, Wilbur Fugit uh, and Henry Caswell. Now, let's start with Henry Caswell. I, I love Henry Caswell so much. This guy was an Episcopalian uh, minister uh, who was also beginning to work in America as a museum curator. Um, and he was conversant with uh, dead languages. He knew ancient Greek. He knew uh, Hebrew. Uh, so he was a Bible scholar. Um, so he had on his person as part of one of the artifact collections he was working with a Greek Psalter, which is just a, a, a Greek manuscript of, of one of the Psalms. Right. Um, and, and he estimated that the Psalter that he had was probably from the 12 or 1300s. Uh, and he said, I'm going to. Not ancient, but Evil, old, yeah, 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 old, very, very old, not ancient, looks, but old. It looks very impressively old, yes, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, to an untrained eye uh, who doesn't know any languages, who doesn't know Greek, who doesn't know what uh, <laughs> parchment is, the difference between parchment and papyri, um, a person like Joseph Smith, let's say, would <laughs> never be able to tell what this actually is. So this guy takes his Greek Psalter and he just saunters into Nauvoo and is, you know, looking at the town and it's beautiful. This is, uh, this is summer of 1842 that this goes on. And he talks to a few Mormons and is like, Hey, I have something that I, you know, I, I saw that you, you have the, the book of Abraham there. I'd like to see that. Uh, could I get a meeting with the prophet? Um, and then he pulls out the Greek Psalter and the people's minds are blown away. <laughs> like you've come to the right place. Our prophet can read the dead languages. Uh, so this guy gets a meeting with Joseph Smith in the Nauvoo mansion. Uh, and he's, so, these guys are surrounded by people, by Mormons. 
and the, the Henry Caswell pulls yeah. out the Greek Psalter and hands it to Joseph Smith. And was like, what do you think of that? And, uh, you know, he, he says, so much. <laughs> I, <laughs> he says, I think it's a Greek Psalter, but I'd love to hear what you think about it. And Joseph Smith, this, this, Joseph Smith said, that ain't Greek. And there's not a word <laughs> of Greek on there. And ah. then later in the conversation, he goes back on that and says, what ain't Greek is Egyptian and what ain't Egyptian is Greek. This is an alphabet of the ancient Egyptian, just like what was written on the gold plates. And he points at the at the capitalized letters at the beginning of each verse and says, that's the Egyptian hieroglyphic. And then that what follows is the Greek interpretation of the Egyptian hieroglyphic. Now, oh. If you look at a Greek Psalter, right? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to screen share again so you can see kind of what a Greek Psalter looks like, and probably what's you know similar to what Joseph Smith was looking wow. at, right? So you have the capitalized Greek at the beginning of each of the verse, and then the verse. Joseph Smith doesn't know shit about any of these languages, right? He's making everything up. <laughs> So he sees these things and says, that's exactly like what was written on the golden plates that I translated into the Book of Mormon. And then after exactly. it is the Greek oh. translation of the reformed Egyptian. And what's beautiful is that it's clear that none of those things are Egyptian hieroglyphs. No. Those are no. all clearly Greek uppercase letters. Clearly, if you know the Clearly. most rudimentary thing about Greek, yeah. Wow. And so, and Henry Caswell did right. So he's right. kind of like chuckling to himself and laughing about this. And he, and and what's cool is, um, uh, so Joseph Smith, he's a hick, right? He is absolutely a hick. Yeah. And he, um, I'm gonna try and find Henry Caswell's uh, uh, statement here because it's so so good. Um, it's going to take me I, just a second. I have some here if you don't, if you can't find it. Uh, I, I'm just trying to find Henry Caswell's article because as soon as he left, uh, he he went and published the whole story and it was hilarious. Right. Um, but so Henry Caswell himself. Which, which I have uh, in my book, by the way, if you want to. You do this. have this story? Good, 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 good. Oh, I love that so much. Yeah. Get, the um, <laughs> Get the book. Serious. Yeah. Uh, so one thing about Joseph Smith is everything that we have of his is uh, is edited. It's very edited. But Joseph Smith talked like a hick. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why people didn't expect him to be the prophet that he claimed to be, because he talked like a hick. Yeah. But everything that all of his sermons, he's very eloquent. He's very well spoken. He's he knows languages. He's very has a very strong command of the English language. But those are, have been edited. Those are most of those have been fabricated. Um the actual the actual words of Joseph Smith rarely peek through the historical record and the way that he talked. Um, Henry Caswell records Joseph Smith's words the way that Joseph Smith talked. And it's really, really incredible because you get to see Joseph's dialect and he it, you lose this veneer of who the you know the Joseph Smith was, uh, and you you get to see yeah. a real version of Joseph Smith. Um, I'm going to find a, just a couple of passages from this because because Henry Castle is just can't find it. I've got some here. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. If, feel free to read. Yeah. I, I'm going to read through a little bit of this article, uh, but please do. Here's one thing he says. Uh, from, this is from his uh, his news story. Pointing to the capital letters at the commencement of each verse, he said, "Them figures is Egyptian hieroglyphics, and then which follows is the interpretation of the hieroglyphics written in the reformed Egyptian." <laughs> Oh my gosh. And because you never hear Joseph Smith talk like that in his sermon. Them figures is Egyptian. Them <laughs> figures is, is hieroglyphics. Because oh, it doesn't, it, yeah. And in our first original editions of the Book of Mormon, the very first editions, he has things like, and the prophet went a walking. And <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Oh, wow. Up, they had to clean up all that corn pone goofiness, uh, linguistic goofiness to. to it. That makes sense, though. That is interesting. Did this guy ever sell this book to Joseph Smith, or did he just like no? Show him? Joe no. tried to buy it, but he said, "I'm not selling." Right. So Joe did want to buy it and put it in his uh, in his. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> here's here's actually the very interaction. Um, oh, here we go. So this is from Henry Caswell's uh, pamphlet that he published. Uh, it's called Three Days of, of Nauvoo, or Three Days at Nauvoo." Uh, uh, he said. 
Uh, upon this, the Mormons around began to congratulate me on the information I was receiving that Joseph Smith was telling him, oh, it's it's Egyptian, it's an interpretation and whatever. The prophet now turned, uh, he said, there they said, we told you so. We told you that our prophet would give you satisfaction. None but our prophet can explain these mysteries. So the people are also sycophants. They just love this, right? This is Joseph yeah, Smith yeah. and his element. Yeah. The prophet now turned to me and said, this book ain't a no use to you. You don't understand it. <laughs> oh, yes, I replied. It is of some use for if I were in want of money, I could sell it for something handsome. And Joseph says, but what will you sell it for? Said the prophet and his dignitaries. My price, I answered, is higher than you would be willing to give. What price is that? They eagerly demanded. I replied that I would not sell it to them for many hundred dollars. They then repeated their request that I should uh, lend it to them until the prophet should have time to translate it <laughs> and promise me the most ample security, but I declined their proposals. We'll give it so, right back when we're in back. all of this. <laughs> Henry Caswell was like, uh, no, Joe, this is this is this is Greek. I know that this is Greek. And then Joe kind of wafts around a little bit and then um he let's see. Uh, he proceeded with me to his office, accompanied by the multitude. He produced the glass frames, which I had seen on the previous day, but he did not appear very forward to explain the figures. Now, the glass frames contain the Egyptian papyri from the Book of Abraham. Right. Uh, so he had those framed and then he would sell people admission to go look at the <laughs> Egyptian papyri and the mummies from which he supposedly translated the book of Abraham. And that's how his mom actually made a living was she was basically the caretaker of these artifacts. Wow. I uh, hear uh, you know, Caswell continues. I pointed to a particular hieroglyphic and requested him to expound its meaning. No answer being returned. I looked up and behold, the prophet had disappeared. <laughs> Joe ghosted this guy when he was like, hey, what does that one mean? What does that one mean? And Joe ghosted him. He continues. It's really great. Um, the prophet had disappeared. The Mormons told me that he had just stepped out and would probably soon return. I waited some time, but in vain and at length descended to the street in front of the store. Here I heard the noise of wheels, and presently I saw the prophet in a light wagon, flourishing his whip and driving away as fast as two fine horses could draw him. <laughs> and Caswell summarizes it perfectly. He says, as he disappeared from view, enveloped in a cloud of dust, I felt that I had turned over another page in the great book of human nature. Wow. Quote. That's well said. That's very yeah. well said. Yeah. Yeah. And the Mormons, after, after this abscond by uh, by Joseph, the Mormons turned to him and he says, well, you know what? This is a Greek Psalter. So they're just like, what do you think? Isn't our prophet amazing? He says, uh, well, no, this is a Greek Psalter, actually. And I know that very well because I speak Greek. And so what am I supposed to think of your prophet now? And so the guy scratches his head and says, well, sometimes Joseph Smith speaks as a prophet and other times he speaks as a mere man. <laughs> so it's like, wow. Dude, Which is literally, <laughs> that's what mormons say today about joseph smith yeah still like to this popes. day it's that like propaganda the works the, ca the catholics do it with the popes Ooh. as well the popes yep. uh he's not speaking infallible right now when he says mm -hmm. that um exactly it is interesting because it, you know what you've done there as we wrap this show up i just want our audience to kind of like take notice he went right back to the root of his entire scandal of golden plates. He literally, if he didn't mention that, oh, that's what's on the golden plates. Uh, what? Like, we know you're <laughs> caught in a lie here. This is Greek. And obviously, anyone who's watching should know that obviously he's saying Egyptian, reformed Egyptian, which is BS. So he's saying that's what's on the golden plates. I wonder if anyone has ever seen the plates that he supposedly had in that box. It's Which funny you wonder. say that, Derek, because as it turns out, just the very next summer, somebody did uncover actual plates, just yeah. like the plates of the Book of Mormon. Actual golden plates that, that we have. We have, I believe they're in the Chicago, uh, the Chicago one, Museum one archive. Meeting. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. We're going to have to talk about that in the next episode. Trying to episode, get to that or should we save that for next week? Yeah. Uh, it's Save cool. it for now. Well, I I don't know, man. I love talking about these two stories in conjunction with each other. We could do we could do these plates in five minutes. Can, so you, can you give us five minutes, Derek? Let's go a little extended. Yes, five Let's minutes. Go. Okay, five minutes. Uh, so, because right. Joe had so much national attention, right? That's what happened with Henry Caswell bringing the Greek Psalter in. Well, there's this other guy named Wilbur Fugit. 
Wilbur Fugit uh, had some metallurgical skills and he and three and two other guys were like, Hey, I bet we could, we could, we could pull one over on the old prophet. Uh, <laughs> wait, so wait, they, you're going to end the story. <laughs> Uh, right. So they uh, they live in a little town near Nauvoo called Kinderhook, Illinois. Yeah. Um, and these guys made they manufactured a set of plates. No, no, of, no. Wait, stop. Stop. <laughs> there was this amazing archaeological discovery. in Kinderhook. So, oh, no, no. OK, you know what? Yeah, you're right. So, uh, yeah, we can't we can't jump the shark. So yeah. these guys tell Joseph's younger brother, hey, uh, Samuel, uh, we found an incredible artifacts. Come and come and help help us dig them out and and see what what can be done so they bring the the plates they they find these plates and you know here i'm going to pull up pictures of them these axe shapes plates of metal connected by rings that are so old that they're encrusted in rust and the rings the coils you know holding all together break apart at their touch um and at first they like try to clean it with uh, soap and water and scrubbing things they can't get the rust off it finally they put it in sulfuric acid and uncover these amazing metal plates with uh, ancient writings on them. Exactly. <laughs> and this is, so this is the one that, uh, that we still have right here, but these are mock-ups of what they probably looked like here. Um, yeah. And, you know, you can, you can see uh, a larger image of this. Um, let me try and pull up a large, well, of course it's not going to pull up a larger image than oh, just well, that, um, but you get the idea. So there's the small brass plates. Yeah, um, with ancient writings and, on them. Yeah, and they're brought into Nauvoo, and Joseph Smith loses his freaking mind, right? Because this is this is a new discovery. This is something yeah. new to translate. This is from the ancient uh, Israelites that roamed this area that <laughs> or became the Native <laughs> Americans. Um, but once again, this is just like the Book of Abraham. Like the people are expecting for Joseph Smith to translate the dead language uh, and to tell him something, tell them something about this. So they receive the, these Kinderhook plates in and uh, Joe publishes in the times and seasons, which is the church's periodical in Nauvoo that he has begun translating these things right. uh, and that they are uh, the story of the person with which they were found. Uh, and he uh, gives a few details of the contents of what's on the Kinderhook plates. Uh, David, right. it looks like you're about to read a passage. He gets, he was a descendant of Ham through the loins of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he received his kingdom from the ruler of heaven and earth. That's about as far as he got to translate that. Yeah. Um, uh, but he, so he did start translating these things, right? Yeah. Uh, he never got around to finishing the project. Just he never published shame. a full translation of them. He just told us shame. what was on them, which is such a shame. I would love to see what the they book of Abraham of version, the BS, book of Kinderhook would. Exactly. And they were yeah. lost forever for all time. So we never knew, even though the church authorities assure us that they were real and legit. And then one day in the sixties, Hey, they found one. They found them again. <laughs> yep, that's right. Uh, and um, and when that one was found in the 60s, once again, that same guy, Hugh Nibley, came out with a defense that was published in the church's periodical, its own periodical, that was a defense that the Kinderhook they, plates are legitimate. They were so excited. And they were yeah. like inviting every, inviting the world to you know examine them scientifically because they were so sure that, yes, this is the real deal. Um, and more than 15 years passed with this knowledge, with this understanding that the Kinderhook plates vindicated the prophet. And finally, I think it was in 1986, a metallurgical study was done <clears throat> with that one remaining plate that we have. And uh, they it's found it. Good, good news, bad news. Good news, bad news. Yes, yep. this is not a forgery. It really is the original Kinderhook plate. Yes. Which, as it turned out, is made of 19th century metal alloy, not yes. ancient. <laughs> that was etched with acid to make it look <laughs> old. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. And this guy, Wilbur Fugit, he oh, didn't God. want to come up, you know, to come out and go public with the fact that he made the plates until after Joseph Smith had published yeah. the the translation but joe died before right. the translation was ever published so the guy just sort of forgot that he ever did it and then <laughs> in like the 1870s or 80s like 30 40 years after this happened he was like oh yeah i remember that oh yeah no i made those plates i etched them with some acid and we buried them and we were yeah we were trying to pull one over on joe yeah. that was it that was it it was inconsequential to him he didn't care he, he was just he was just trying to screw around with the prophet uh, but it's yet one more example that just unequivocally proves how much joe was lying he he and was a fraud also, he was a grifter and it's a classic example of the same song and dance of look these are real 
real. See, we told you so. Oh, wait, yep. it's not real, but that's okay. Oh, you know what? They just inspired Joseph Smith. You know, it's exactly. It's like the it's like the biblical scholars who talk about the forgeries in the New Testament says, well, those were inspired by God too. It's like, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, James sure. didn't Why really not? write that, but it's in the yeah, vein really of James, that. in the spirit of James, even though the author's not exactly. really James or First Peter or exactly. Second Peter. Because, you know, that was a great honor back then. They did that out of love for them, and it was very well respected. Right. It was a totally mm, common thing yeah. that everybody did. Yeah. yeah. Not at all <laughs> condemned by ancient sources who talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Much more than we did. Yeah. yeah, Bart Ehrman doesn't know what he's talking about. No, no, Bart Ehrman's the one who points out these things. I like, know, I'm oh, joking, like, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> no, Bart is great. His book, Forgery and Counterforgery in Christianity, exactly. just shows all this stuff going on. Yeah, yeah I love yeah. this book, Forge. But th- I want everybody who's watching this to s- just imagine, just imagine with what Bryce and David have brought to you today, okay? <laughs> um, imagine if Joe would have stayed alive another 20 or 30 mm. years, okay? Mm. How many more stunts like this would have yes. been pulled on him? No. Oh, so good. That would have oh. been so good. It, it, you know, How he- more wives would he have had? <laughs> oh, right? Oh. Yeah. Didn't oh, think yeah. about that one. you know tell me what you guys think down in the comments section i think it'd be hilarious to imagine he's just one of those guys who has a fantastic imagination because i know a guy i'm gonna leave unnamed um that i've actually played along with this like he always knows everything and one time i said hey uh did you hear about in the news they found that a person's body in a in a black trash bag chopped up in little pieces here in cumberland county and he's like yeah, I did hear about that actually. And I made it up. Like I literally <laughs> just fabricated it. And then I'm like, dude, I was just checking. I literally was testing you because you always know everything. And he goes, no, 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 you didn't hear. There was, it may not have been in Cumberland County, but like literally there was a body chopped up. And I mean, that's the, that's what they do. It's a yeah. personality thing. Yeah. 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 Oh, it just yeah. impervious to facts. Yes. And th- there are certain people you can you can recognize them from a mile off. They are just impervious to information and to reality. They fabricate their own reality and they're happy inside that little world. It just yeah. so happens that Joe's little fabricated reality extended far beyond his own little mind. It incorporated yeah. tens of thousands of people and now millions of people. And you know what's the miracle about Mormonism is, I mean, it is complete bullshit start to finish. There's just no two ways about it. No polite way to say it. It is complete bullshit. And yet look at what this family run business has done. I mean, it's the miracle of Mormonism is that it's accomplished as much as it is out of sheer bullshit. It's spun gold that is sheer bullshit. Really is. And it's also really ruined is. many millions of lives. It's ruined yeah. as many lives as it's uplifted. So, you know. Wow. I- I will also say, right? Well, far more. It's it's yeah. Mormonism has a a very high body count. Um, yeah. I, I'll also add into this, right? Like when you recognize these individuals that are just completely impervious to to facts, like there's, it's really hard to break through that mold. It's hard to break into that echo chamber. And like the the three stories that we talked about with the Book of Abraham, the Kinderhook plates, and the Greek Psalter incident, those three stories alone, right there, prove. No shadow of a doubt that Joseph Smith was lying about it and that he knew he was lying, but that the fact that he was lying didn't matter. He could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and they would still love him, right? Nothing he could do would cause his people to not love him and not want to die for him. And that right there is a truly dangerous personality. Yep. Yep. And again, if he'd lived for another 20 years, run for president, who knows what this country would look like? Yeah, you know. true. Yeah. Guys, gals, leave your comments down below. Tell me what you guys think. Don't forget to visit Bryce Blankenagle, Naked Mormonism podcast, and his Patreon, as well as David Fitzgerald, the West, uh, Western Guide to... No, I'm sorry. The Mormons, <laughs> but the... Complete the Heretics Guide to Western, Western, Western Religion. Guide. Yes, I'm trying to memorize everything. And uh, <laughs> no, I knew that actually. Uh, I just was, um, you know, 
<laughs> you, were, you were just testing him, testing him about his own book. I knew yeah. all about that. I wanted to see if you knew. That's why I was doing this. Yeah, uh, perfect example, right? Ladies and gentlemen, I want you guys to join these guys, helping them in their endeavors and doing what they're doing. I'm so glad we didn't stop at 12 episodes. Uh, we shot that one, like clearly is not even on the map anymore. We're just focusing on the material and having fun doing this. This is all for you guys, but I'm also really enjoying this series. I hope you are too. Tell me what you guys think. Reach out to these guys, you know, uh, try and be part of what they do. And, you know, who knows? We might could do a lot more on this if it becomes, um, I guess you'd say, beneficial to these gentlemen to want to continue doing this. Of course, we're going to end the series, but who knows if we could do more um, endeavors if you guys make that possible. So it's really up to you, the viewer, on whether or not that's something you guys want to make happen. So thank you so much, guys, for this information. I can't wait to find out what more happens uh, in the next episode. And with that being said, I guess we'll close out with saying we are Myth Vision. I have hundreds of videos on the Patreon. Become a Patreon and get early access to everything I ever launched. Join the Twitter. I've got a Discord chat room. You guys can help grow the community. One-time PayPal or Cash App if you want to help us out with a donation. And join our Facebook groups, man. Let's make this thing happen.